Hello, and welcome to you all. Um, it's great to see a diverse audience here for the first of this year's three conversations um, with senior women. And Bridget Kendall will be familiar to many of you from her work with the BBC, but of course she is now master of Peterhouse, so slight change of tack. But what many of you may not know is actually she's known Churchill practically from the beginning because her father was a fellow here um, and uh, taught statistics. So what was it like being brought up in Cambridge, sort of close to a college, even if you weren't living here? Uh, well, I wasn't living in the college, no, no. but we lived in Cambridge. So um, I, actually, I, I, I found it very interesting coming back to Cambridge, having left it in the mid-1970s. So I was brought up here in the 60s and 70s, when it really was a very, um, it was a bit of a backwater, let's be fair. What, the whole town? Yes, I used to joke to my friends, I went to Oxford University afterwards, that Oxford was on the way to Birmingham points north, the sort of central spine of the country, whereas Cambridge was on the way to King's Lynn and Lorridge. <laughs> and, and the Fens. And the Fens, yes, and it had a slight feeling of a, 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 very, a top-class university in a small market town, um, people playing lutes and wearing <laughs> um, muslin dresses and being slightly out of the mainstream. Um, and very charming, but for if you were, you know, in your teens, you're thinking, this is a place I want to get away from because it's not the big world out there. Um, and uh, that's, of course, a total exaggeration and a caricature. Cambridge was a wonderful place, but that's what it felt like as a yeah. teenager. Yeah. Churchill felt brand new, raw. I remember coming here with my father. He, I think we moved in, we, we, we came to Cambridge in 62, and I used to come on Saturday mornings he would come up here and, and say to my brother and me, you can draw on this blackboard, but don't erase the formula at the top. <laughs> um, and, and, and then we'd go for a walk, and then he'd take us into lunch in the hall. Uh, and right up to the edge of the college were ploughed fields, and then a, you know, Barbara Hepworth sculpture, and then you know, agricultural lands. And it felt very much on the edge of the, very, very edge of the yes. city and of the university very new and very, with the winds coming off the fens, blowing through the concrete walls of the college. It felt very exposed, actually. Yes. That's what Churchill felt I mean, like. one of the I mean, things that's, that's interesting now is how much Churchill is not at the edge yes. anymore. It's yeah. sort of getting engulfed. And, you know, we have to hope that that is attractive to students instead of thinking, I mean, you're at Peterhouse, so you're really in the centre. And, and here, we would have been seen as at the fringe, but now with all the developments on West Cambridge and North West Cambridge, yeah. it's very different. And Cambridge has changed so much, so no one could say it's, it's just, you know, Cambridge is a destination in its own right. There's a motorway, the M11. The train now takes 45 minutes. I remember that when the train from, you never took the train to, train to King's Cross because no. it just took so long through the all Liverpool the villages. The Liverpool Street was the first one. Mm. And so now Cambridge is, well, you know, we're all, battling with that, aren't we, that Cambridge is a place that's near enough to London for people to commute in from, and look what that's done to housing prices, so the whole place is completely transformed. But you wanted to get away? I wanted to get to, yes. So I think I thought of my background and upbringing as very kind of small and safe and um, protected. Perhaps that's one reason I went into modern languages, because that was an avenue to go to other worlds. And, um, and then I definitely went to university to get away from my parents. My younger sister went to Keyes College and she said it was very weird getting up in the morning and you'd go down to the market square, you know, after a heavy night and you'd meet your mother buying <laughs> fruit. <laughs> uh, not what you wanted. So that, that was the, the, in those days, everyone always went away to university. Yes. Now it's much less common because, well, it's, it, more people stay closer to home and there are good financial reasons yes. for that, of course. Um, but that's why I went away. And then I went to Oxford to study, well, first French and Russian, and then I focused just on Russian because I was determined to get to Russia. So why Russian? What, what ever got you started well, on because that? because it's a fantastic language. And um, Did you do it at school? I did. I have to confess, Athene, that at my school, which is the Purse, you could specialise very early. And I was already doing French and Latin and love languages, so I wanted to take up another one. And you could do either German seemed a bit close to home and dull, 
Ancient Greek, well, that's a dead language, or Russian, definitely Russian. But um, what you had to do was to give up most science. So I must confess, it's a bit embarrassing for me to say this to you, but I did one year of physics and one year of chemistry, and well, that I don't was think it. much of the purse. I managed at my <laughs> school, I could do, so I was at the school in North London, I could do French and Latin and a third language, and I had the choice of German, which I did, or Greek, or Spanish, or Russian, but I did German. And two sciences. No, okay, okay sorry. Yes, I, so I'm sure I, it's I, not I was the case able to anymore. do all of it. But I, I was, I must admit, through a lot of my life, quite ill, ill schooled in the in the basic sciences. Later on, um, how many years ago now? Uh, nine years ago, I was asked to um, uh, host a BBC program on the World Service called the Forum, which I still do. When we would take um, different subjects with specialists every week. And I used to stay up all weekend reading about quantum physics and chemistry and to be just, you know, in, in the slightest bit equipped to, to talk to these top academics, sometimes Nobel Prize winners about their subject. So I did try and make up for it much later on. Yes, I mean, well, we can get on to science versus art. So let me just give you my um, converse of this. So when I was asked, or when Andrew Marr was doing Start the Week, and I put, I put out a, a title about... Um, from yogurt to Alzheimer's, um, a physicist's view of protein aggregation. Mm. And for some reason, someone in the BBC thought this made me a good guess for the start of the week. And I was supposed to read um, the Seabag Montefiore book on Jerusalem, a book about Civil War poetry, and uh, Simon Wesley was the fourth guest. And, and the researcher who rang me up said, you know, well, what can we use from what you're doing that the others can relate to? And no one said, well, what do you know about Jerusalem or Civil War poetry? And there is this presumption that as a scientist, I can just do it. And it's, you know, the same presumption is not always made in reverse. And I'm impressed you sat up all No, no. And I, you know, I'm a big advocate now. Of, you know, if, if um, it's a hard, quite a hard question to me if people say in your education, do you think you did the right thing? There you were, you specialised very early with languages. And I would now say, well, yes, but at a sacrifice. Yes. And I think at the time, I thought, great, I don't need to do chemistry. But now, if somebody says to me, I want to do chemistry, I say, how exciting. Yes. Because it is so exciting yes. now. And it actually, also, the subject has changed. And they're, they're, the sciences now, they're all intertwined. And, you know, I have a niece who's a mathematician, but she's working with biologists. Yes. And, it, it is fantastically exciting. Yes, so. well, I will admit I gave up biology at the earliest possible moment, which, given I work physics at the interface with biology now, is kind of ironic, but one doesn't necessarily make good choices at 14, which was when I made that choice. I gave up biology and I gave up geography as fast as I could, and they're both wonderful subjects. So, but still, Russian was just seen as... Yeah, no, I mean, it was... Um, I think also my father was... Uh, so, you know, roll back the clock, um, no internet... Um, Cold War, he was a mathematical statistician and it became clear to him in that little thaw that there was during the Khrushchev years from the late 50s to early 60s. And when he went to Russia, I think he went in 62 to Russia and Georgia. And then also he would go to Europe and he met a lot of East European mathematicians. And he became aware that in his field people were doing interesting things and they weren't travelling, mm -hmm. and that if you wanted to find out what they were doing, you had to go to them. And they weren't publishing in English journals either. They'd have Not published in Russian journals. Presumably. Well, I mean, he was also dealing with colleagues in Romania and Bulgaria particularly, but in the Soviet republics, he had colleagues in Soviet Armenia and in Lithuania and also in Tashkent. Um, so he made a bit of a point of travelling to these places. So I think that probably influenced me yes. too, that I yes. had a connection and a feeling of people. And that things were happening there. Yeah, and that it was a whole world there that we didn't know about. So when did you first go there? Oh, I didn't go for a while. There um, um, wasn't any money to go. And anyway, in those days, let's remember, it's very difficult to get to Soviet Russia. Um, you couldn't just get a job, a holiday job, or just buy a ticket. I mean, these days it's quite difficult to get a visa again, but in those days it was really difficult. You had to be part of an official tour group, so that was expensive, or you had to be invited by some institute. Well, you know, I was a schoolgirl who was going mm. to invite me. Um, or you needed a private invitation. That was almost impossible. And uh, so one of the reasons, one of, one of, the, one of the, good, the goals in going to university was to find a way to get there. And um, so I didn't go till 1976, and I first went on a, 
a month's, uh, I got a scholarship to go for a month. But after that, my aim was to get a British Council scholarship. They had about a dozen a year for undergraduates. Most of them, the, the scholarships were going to postgraduates. It was a exchange scheme with the Soviets who were very keen to send people here who are usually older and um, working in the sciences and basically it was a means of industrial espionage. <laughs> um, so, but the Brits were sending people back so there were a certain group of postgrads doing Russian, mostly literary or history, whatever. So but we there weren't were never sending enough. scientists over. We were sending no, we weren't sending scientists over. They didn't <coughs> particularly want to go and didn't have the Russian. Mm. So there were usually a dozen places left for undergrads. So I applied for this scholarship, and I, you know I can remember to this day arriving at Spring Gardens in London, British Council headquarters, thinking this day could change my life. And there were 12 places, and I was 13th, and I didn't get it. And it was a massive setback. Um, so how did you cope with that? Well, I mean, you know, it's very difficult. I had to just, you know, unlike Cambridge with tripods and exams every, every um, summer in Oxford, they store it all up for the end. So all I had to look forward to was a year of revision for the final big exams. And, of course, I hadn't, you know, in my mind, I hadn't... I, yeah, that wasn't what I was planning. I was planning to have a year in Russia yes. to take it a bit more slowly. So it was tough. But then, luckily, in September, someone pulled out. And so I could go after all. And it did change my life. And it changed your life because you lived out your dream of getting there and seeing what well, it's I, like? I, yeah, I got there and it was extraordinary. It was like going to the moon. This wasn't <laughs> Moscow. This was provincial Russia. Um, Why was it like going to the moon? It was just so Alien? different. Yes. Yeah. And what they, people would stop you in the street, say, oh, where are you from? Because they could tell by your clothes you were foreign. They didn't need KGB to follow us. We were just so obviously <laughs> foreigners. Um, and uh, they'd say, oh, you're from Britain. How many cows does your father have? <laughs> or um, uh, a very common question would be, how many rooms do you live in? Because most people yeah. lived in one or two rooms. Yeah. We lived in a lovely house on Barrow Road with five bedrooms. So they, you know, they would assume you were some kind of lord, you know, because you lived in this huge house. Well, I mean, it was a pretty big house, but we had a large family. I had five brothers and sisters. Well, that was also extraordinary. And um, they had no conception of what life in the West was like at all. They thought it was like what they read about in um, Dickens, um, that there were poor people and begging on the streets. Well, actually, you know, there are a few. Um, but this was pre-Thatcher. Um, that um, there was smog everywhere, that there were capitalisti. Um, we were known as the students from the Kapstranje, from the Kapitalistische Stranje, as opposed to the Sotstranje, from the socialist countries. So there were lots of East Germans and Vietnamese and Syrians, actually. Right. And, um, and then this tiny group of people from the enemy camp. And so you were studying at the university? Studying or you at were the university working? and living in a student hostel with... Um, uh, Soviet students, four to a room, small room. Um, I mean, how small? Well, just enough room for four beds and two wardrobes and a table and a television. A television? You had a television. One of my Russian roommates was from Baku. She had a television. But this, the, the, this was all, you know, it was very interesting, A, to be, have to live in, in, a, in a, such a confined space for 10 months um, with shared bathrooms with the whole hostel and terrible food and no hygiene and I mean in the, the shared kitchen they took out the ovens because someone had once tried to gas themselves so that was their solution take out the ovens and everything nothing was clean the cockroaches everywhere and also you knew very well that the Soviet students who were living in the same hostel with you were instructed to report on you so it's very complicated and you enjoyed it Yes, because it was like being on the moon. <laughs> it was a completely different world. I mean, especially if you're brought up in Cambridge, so this beautiful medieval city. I mean, I had no idea what it was like not to live in a place as lovely as this. Mm -hmm. There was I complaining it was like, you know, a, a market town only on the way to King's Lynn. Actually, I realised I was living in paradise in comparison to most people in the world. And Voronish was razed to the ground by the Germans, rebuilt, um, a lot of new build industrial town, a lot of drunkenness, um, corrupt as anything, uh, absolutely without any kind of um, mitigating 
uh, alleviation under the thumb of the Communist Party and the bureaucracy. And um, yet there were, you know, upwards of a million people living there. And um, it's slightly hard to see why you enjoyed it. The way you're describing it <laughs> haven't really sold it to me yet. Because it, it wasn't forever. It was for 10 months. You learnt Russian, so you learnt to speak Russian, so that was the fantastic thing. Although at the end of it, I thought, I've got to carry on doing this because I don't speak Russian well enough yet. Right. But um, most people had never met a Westerner. They had no idea what the rest of the world was like. You were in the world that was the other side of the, of the wall, of the Cold War yes. wall, yes. actually seeing how people lived. And they lived very poorly. There was no meat in the town. Um, you could go to the private markets and buy a scraggly chicken, but you couldn't get any fresh fish. You could get three sorts of salami, three sorts of cheese and eggs and lots of milk products and any amount of cakes and bread. Um, you'd get vodka. You could sometimes get Bulgarian wine and Bulgarian cigarettes. No coffee, no citrus fruits. I remember Bulgarian wine. That's what we used to live on. We were students, cheap Bulgarian red, and it was disgusting. <laughs> but it's quite, I think it's very good when you're that age to suddenly be put in a, an environment which is so different on every level, political, economic. Yes, I mean, presumably you either sink under the feeling of this is alien and I just don't know how to slot in or what I'm doing here, or else you think, hey, this is quite exciting. Maybe I'll travel the world for a career. Which I guess is slightly more what you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm. Um, it's. It's. I think it's very humbling. I mean, one of the things I learned, I was um, very keen on theatre. I did a lot of design and art and things like that. And I think I always thought, you know, you, the way people dressed was important to me and the sense of design. You go to a place like Voronezh. And you learn quite quickly that the people who have interesting clothes and nice shoes are the ones you really don't trust. Because they're spies? Because yeah. they're getting paid more? Because they, they have some sort of access to yes. this system which was yes. corrupt and, um, and um, bad, really. And that the people who dressed poorly and looked a mess were probably the nicest people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when you're that age, that's a very good thing to learn early. And it's a sort of, you know... A good corrective, and it made me realise what a um, privileged upbringing I'd had. But it's probably not a very useful guide in trying to inspect, you know, work out who you want to meet in later life, who are the nice people, because you can't use clothes as in the West. No, you would, that's what you realise, I think, isn't it, that you have to look beneath the surface. You have to look beneath And the that's actually useful if you're going to go on to a career in journalism, definitely. And did you know that's what you wanted to do at that no, point? No, 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 I had no idea I was going to be a journalist. Absolutely none. So when did you make that decision? That came later. So I came back to do my degree, decided to do post-grad because, you know, Russia was so amazing. Went off to America for two years, came back to my graduate college in Oxford, which was St. Anthony's, and back to Moscow for a year. So now the time... And you were doing research during that time? I was doing time. research, Russian literature, yes. Uh, we're 81, 82, uh, 81, and the Soviet Union's got even more dysfunctional and corrupt. By now I'm in Moscow. But um, still, I, I had contacts in the provinces, travelled a lot. And it was pretty clear to me and everyone I knew who was Russian. Uh, and I lived in a very Russian world. I didn't really interface with many foreigners in Moscow in that year. That the place was on the cusp of change. Brezhnev was about to die. Most of my Russian friends thought that the lid would come back down, there would be purges and the gulags would open up again and life would be like the 1930s. Um, in fact, the father of a friend of mine said, stay in touch with my daughter, Bridget, because you young people might be able to keep in touch with each other. We may all be totally cut off from the world again. Who knows what's around the corner? Um, actually, of course, he was wrong. What was around the corner, it turned out, in a couple of years, was Gorbachev and the lifting of the lid. And in the end, as we all know, the whole thing collapsed and the Soviet Union Remarkably disappeared. Remarkably fast. But no yes. Exactly. Nobody, nobody, including most Russians I knew in 1981, had any idea that could be possible. Um, but what I had a very strong sense of was that this was an extraordinary place and I wanted to watch it. And I wasn't going to do that from libraries. And so I applied to the BBC. So that's how I decided to be a journalist. And, and you, uh, you applied to the BBC to keep your Russian contacts? Well, no, I think it was more just 
the, an awareness of how interesting the world was unfolding around me. And, well, Russia was one part of it, but probably other bits would be too. And that um, I thought that I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to watch it, find oh. out about it, be there, report on it. Um, and not at that point to have the more analytical, analytical stand back research view of an academic. Uh, in fact, the first um, reporting job I had that the BBC sent me on was, the first one was to cover elections in Greece uh, in 1985, was it? I can't remember. Um, and then the second one that year, definitely, was to go to Berlin to report on the anniversary of the end of the Second World War, a programme to be around June the 6th. And it was fantastic. I went and interviewed um, uh, someone who was part of the um, general's plot of the um, German officers, the officer's plot, who um, uh, rose up against Hitler, but then had to disappear. And he'd, after that, lived the rest of the war in hiding in Berlin, came out on June 6th. And a young Jewish woman who'd been hidden by people in Berlin um, so Berlin at this point was, this was still before the wall had fallen. Uh, yes, exactly. So I went over to East Germany too. Um, I didn't meet anyone. It wasn't possible at that time to meet anybody except official East Germans. It was too controlled. Yes. But even the process of going through, um, through the checkpoints yes. and, you know, within an hour finding yourself from the giddy lights of West Berlin into this austere slightly as far weird as I East German I mean, I went capital. through Checkpoint Charlie in seven, oh, probably 69 or 70. It's just astonishing. You just go straight through, mm. and then it's all concrete and nothing in yeah. the shops and everything. Yeah, empty. Different smell, different petrol smell. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, so, that, you know, the, the, so it, to that extent, joining the BBC gave me, even without Russia, exactly what I wanted, which was I was being sent on assignment to go to very interesting places and meet interesting people. But then, of course, Gorbachev appeared, and then they started sending me to all the superpower summits and back to Russia to make to different parts of the Soviet Union to, to explore what was happening. And it, it just snowballed, and it was the most extraordinary experience to have. And you lived right to. through that transition. Yeah. And then and what, you sent, were living there? I was sent full-time. To, in the end, they said, Bridget, you're there so much. Why you know, we need someone else in Moscow to go and be full-time correspondent in Moscow in 1989 and I thought well I'm not sure how long this Gorbachev experiment will last yeah. but maybe I'll see the tail end of it um, I, last thing I thought was that the whole thing would gather such momentum that it would all explode That's a couple of years after fast. I arrived yeah. yes. uh, so, so, so um, yeah so um, that was a good choice to study Russian yes. I must admit that my father um, formerly of Churchill um, gave me good advice early on when I was thinking of what to do and he said you know, you're very keen on art and English and things like that, but do Russian because you'll stand out in a crowd and people will always want to interview you and, and you'll always have something, um, you know, a bit, a bit, bit special, which will... And, and I, I found that through my life and I, I talk to young people a lot about studying modern languages and tell them that story. It, it, it really has opened so many doors for and me. And that's presumably still true because the number of people doing foreign language... Yeah, Modern languages is, is, yeah. is going down. Yeah. Yeah. So you were sent off to all these interesting cities to interview people, presumably, and to keep your ear to the ground. What training did you get to do this? On the job. Yes, I thought that might be the answer. So, <laughs> so you I make a, it up as you go along? No, I had, an, a, um, I had four weeks radio training, and then I was put on the main um, <coughs> current affairs programme for the World Service, which is called 24 Hours. went out four times a day. And, um, yeah, it was sink or swim. I had very good people who helped me. What, mentors who said that wasn't very good, you should have done it this yeah. way? There was my first editor was a man called Benny Armar, and he was very good. I remember at one point he took me aside and he said, Bridget, you know a lot, but you're very retiring. Be more assertive. And right. it, was good, it, was good, it was good advice. So, so he felt you weren't getting enough out of the person you were interviewing because you, you let no, them No, that dominate. was about morning meetings. It ah. was about not speaking up in morning ah, meetings. Oh, okay. I think this happens a lot with, I don't know, young women of my sort. You sit and you, I think I still do it actually, I probably do it in our heads of houses meetings. You sit and wait and see what other people say oh, yes. and then decide what can you say that would be useful. But you don't, you don't barge in, in first. No. 
But so, you know, what, I suppose what I want to say is just that there were people along the way who were helpful and um, who I'm very grateful to. And uh, those were two early people who were very helpful. And that's just serendipity. I mean, you, you can't go out and find these people necessarily. Mm. I mean, it does seem to me that, that luck plays such an enormous part in life. I mean, in your case, timing as well. Mm. But, but, you know, you can plan only so far. And, and I feel very strongly that if you are 18 or 21 or whatever, and you look around and think, well, they've succeeded, they must have known exactly what they wanted to do. Well, it's not like that. Things happen and you have to make the most of them. I used to joke I had five-year plans because, um, you know, the Soviet Union always had five-year plans. So um, the first one was actually the, the role model was a woman um, who, um, a young woman who'd been at my school and she'd done Russian and she came back and said she'd been to university and then she'd done this year in Russia and I thought, I want to do that. Yeah. That's my five-year plan going right. forward. And you achieved that one. <laughs> and I did it. And then afterwards, um, I thought... Um, Yes, I think I want to go into postgrad work. I think my Oxford degree was great, but it was mainly literature. I need to broaden myself. I'll go for this two-year scholarship in the States. I'll come back for a year, then I'll go to Russia, and then, you know, I'll finish up five years. So and you I'm, managed that? I, well, I didn't quite, because I diverted off to the BBC. But, you know, okay, anyway, five-year plan. But I think five years is kind of good, because, you know, it's good to have a goal, a sense of something you want to do, and go for it. Um, but if you try and look too far ahead, you know, the world changes so yeah. fast. You might meet someone. You might have another idea. You might change. So definitely that's what happened to and, me. And, you know? and um, so five years is kind of useful. And, and so Peter, the House, wasn't wrong about P something. Peter House, did that feature in your five-year plan ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just happened. It no. turned up and no. the moment was right. Um, well... I, so I did five years in Moscow as Moscow correspondent, did five years in Washington as Washington correspondent, then came back as diplomatic correspondent, and then I stayed in that over 15 years. But the world was changing fast. Um, in diplomatic terms, it was a fascinating time to stay in one place because everything else was revolving around you. Mm. Um, no longer the nuclear threat, it was the Al-Qaeda threat. Um, the war in Iraq... Um, the emergence, the changes our digital media brought and what that did to the information space, we're still trying to make sense of, and so on. The, the Arab Spring, you know, social media played a role there too, these uprisings from below and how they happen and where they lead to and what they mean. So I stayed in that a long time, but then, um, so after about 15 years, I did, in fact, my partner, Amanda, who you've met, she said, you know, Bridget, if you want to do something else, you've got to do it now. You'll be too old. <laughs> so um, she gave me a bit of a nudge. Right. Oh. OK. Now, before we leave the BBC, um, BBC has not always had good press recently about women and pay. So leaving aside the pay, what was it like as a woman in the BBC? So um, I think... I arrived at a time when they were just beginning to promote women into more editorial positions, higher, um, you know, not just secretaries, um, um, uh, but people who were actually making programmes. Um, a report came out just as I arrived of the, a woman who'd made it much higher to be controller of Radio 4, Monica Sims, and she was asked to do, make, uh, conduct an inquiry into women at the BBC. And she came out with a very strong message that there was a glass ceiling, that women went up the editorial chain, you know, producer, senior producer, but they never really ran a department, and they certainly never got to higher management. And that hit a bit of a raw nerve, I think. Mm. With um, So when was this? So this was 83, 84. Right. Yeah. So um, I think because I came in sort of via a training scheme, in fact, I was rejected from the training schemes, but then because I spoke Russian, people offered me jobs anyway. So that was another setback that was a sort of um, useful learning curve. But because I was a, on this training scheme, they were always quite sort of... I, I did get promoted um, relatively quickly. And they, they even sent me on a women in management training course. For um, It was a three-day course. So this is mid-'80s. It was quite useful. 
I do remember that at one point they wanted to bring in a woman manager to kind of talk to us about what it was like to be a manager. And the only one they could find was head of makeup. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't any other women managers. And presumably there weren't many men in the makeup team either. No. But oh um, uh, there, were, there was a bit of a, the door was just beginning to okay. open a bit. And I think that I was a beneficiary. Um, given my education and where I came from, and you know, I was very useful to them. Yes. So when I went to Moscow, for example, in '89 as foreign correspondent, I think I, I wasn't the first woman foreign correspondent, but I was probably the second or third. Okay. So there weren't very many women doing that, and um, there are was. Are there more now? Yes. Yes. There it's are a significantly lot more, more. Significantly more, um, and there was some cultural hostility to it. Um, I got quite bullied. Um, from one of the newsrooms back in London, there was one man who'd ring me at two in the morning and say, oh, we've just got this piece of news on task. Can you check it out for us? And I would say, well, it's two in the morning. He said, it doesn't matter. We might want to lead with it. Um, and I said, I don't think it's new. He said, go and check it out anyway. So, you know, because I was new and yeah, what it's hard to say How no, I went and checked it out and found out it was indeed not new. And I remember coming back and ringing him back and saying, look, it isn't new. And this conversation would be broadcast on the Tannoy throughout the newsroom in London. So that's why it was bullying, because he was playing a game with yes. me. And I'd say, it's not new. And he'd say, we've made it a headline anyway. Write us a story. So, you know, that's sort of, you know, if I had been older and different, I might have said, sod off. But, but, but on but the open Tannoy, asked, it's quite hard to... If you're being asked and they are running it as a lead story, did they actually do that? Or did they make you write the story and then drop it? No, 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 they ran it, but it was, it was a bit of sport. Wasn't that an opportunity then? I mean, here, you're right. You're writing gifted. stories all the time for them, all okay. day and every day. <laughs> okay. You know, at two in the morning as well. Yeah. That was just yes. exploitation. And, and could you were... imagine that would still happen? No, I don't think so. But there was a follow-on to that story, which is quite interesting, which was a few years later, um, well, a year or so later, so the story had become very... Um, I mean, it was the gripping story everyone in the world was watching by then because... Um, uh, it was clear the Soviet Union was heading for a, a crisis of some sort, and I was never off the radio. Uh, the head of the newsroom had retired and had come on a tourist trip to uh, the Soviet Union, and he had got in touch ahead of time and said, can I call on you? And I did what I always used to do, which was to invite him and his wife to lunch, because I knew how hard it was to get lunch in Moscow, <laughs> because the restaurants were always... Closed for lunch, frankly. Uh, well, they never had anything very much. So I, it was always, you know, what I would do if there were visitors in town was offer them lunch. Uh, they came to lunch. I gave him a, a lift to the metro afterwards. And in the car, he said, I do feel I owe you an apology because I always thought you wouldn't, weren't up to it. I didn't think you should have the job. But I was wrong. You're very good. And I felt, on the one hand, well, good for him for being so frank. And on the other hand, how dare he? apologising. But on the other hand... So that's what all that bullying was about. You yeah. know, there was a culture there which never really believed in me. So I think, you know, on the one hand, I was a benefit, a benefiting from a new mood. But on the other hand, there was some residual resistance to it. And actually, I just, I guess I was just not the kind of person who got distracted by it. But it wasn't very fair what went on and, behind and the scenes. And did it actually fire you up? I think, as you say, <laughs> sod you, I'm going to prove you wrong. Perhaps a bit. Um, I certainly, I think at certain points, I, I felt I got to prove to people I'm tough. Yes. And would, you know, go to front lines and, you know, do reports under fire and things like that. Probably now I think that's ridiculously dangerous. I shouldn't have done that. But I think at the time I felt I had to prove to everyone, including me, that, that you, I was you, up to yes. it. Uh, yeah. I survived. I didn't, nothing awful happened. You haven't been shot as far as no, I know. No, I've, I've been fine. I mean, I was lucky. Um, I mean, Russia, presumably, it wasn't shooting that would have been the problem there. Well, it could be. Um, I had a colleague who was um, shot dead in a demonstration in 1993 in Moscow, okay. Rory Peck. Um, certainly kidnapping in the Caucasus yes. was a hazard. Yes. Uh, so I was lucky. But, um, you know, when you're young, you do try and prove yourself. Everybody Indeed. does. And, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, as they say. Yeah, it's it's yeah, fine, yeah. but sometimes it does kill you. Yeah. Um, and you were talking earlier about voice and pitch. Oh, yes, this is before we, yes. we had a conversation before. Yes, 
So um, this was another interesting encounter I had in the mid-1980s. So I had been working as a journalist for a couple of years and done some reporting on Pakistan and was invited to the Pakistani High Commission. And there were quite a few other London journalists there, including a veteran newsreader who was um, uh, male. Um, and he said, who are you to me? And I said, well, I'm a reporter at the World Service. And he looked at me and he said, hmm, I think women's voices are too high to carry any authority. I don't think they should have them on the radio, and walked off. So I've told that story quite a lot, and the, usually the next thing I say is, um, so he's retired, and I'm BBC diplomatic correspondent. You know, like, that's how the world's changed. But it was just, it's quite an interesting thing, this thing about voice. Um, because if you listen to archive recordings, actually, sometimes my colleagues used to get our archive recordings of me and say, Bridget, listen to yourself, how high your voice was and how it's dropped. You, you have brought it down? Well, not consciously, but it has come down. Interesting. Um, but it's certainly, if you listen to the Queen from 1963, I'm sure you all heard her, right up there with that very, those round vowels, but also very high. Yes, she's Much still got the round vowels. Yes, but it's a bit lower. Her <laughs> voice. But I think, and so this is an interesting question, whether... Um, if women, do women pitch their voices lower as they gain in confidence or just as they get older? Or do they pitch their voices lower because they realise in a cultural environment where men have been in positions of authority, a lower voice is the kind of right thing to do because that was what people pick and, up and on and perceive that as being more authoritative? I mean, as I said to you, so at a certain point in my life when I perhaps didn't feel I was making as much headway as I could and a friend colleague, anyhow, a friendly colleague, said to me, have you thought of going on voice coaching lessons to lower your voice? And I was so angry. I thought, what matters is what I say, not what the pitch of my voice is. Mm. And I certainly did not go on voice coaching. But, you know, maybe that is still the case. That, that see, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, you're right. It's, it's important what the content is. But I spent my career in a walk of life where it does matter what you look like and how you sound. Yes. And so I've always paid a lot of attention to these things. Yes. And um, I suppose in academia you think um, it shouldn't matter. It should only be, you mm. know, what am I publishing or, you know. Mm. But, but apparently not. But. So communication is, um, yeah, sometimes the way you communicate is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, um, it's complicated, I think, because... Uh, we, we had a session at the college recently, a symposium for graduates, so I did a, a masterclass with them before on public speaking, and one of the things I said to them was, before you go on, just mentally pitch your voice low. Mm -hmm. Pitch it down there, and start speaking from down there, from down inside your diaphragm. You will have more control over your voice, and it'll come out lower, and you will feel more in control and more confident. But how much of that's a mind trick? Because we're in a society where we think we ought to speak low. So then if you speak low, you're thinking, well, that's making me feel more confident because I'm probably making the right impression. And, so and I don't know. I, I don't know the answer I mean, thinking this, about but... Mary Beard, who I interviewed last year, maybe the year before, I don't, I'm trying to think what her voice pitch is because, of course, one of the things in her recent book is about you know, how, how men, mm. right through classical times onwards, try to silence women. Now, if you talk in a higher voice, is it easier to be silenced? It's not clear to me. But may, maybe you are less likely to be silenced if you're talking now. I should try talking. <laughs> I don't know. It, it is, I it think is. it's hard to disentangle. No, exactly. But you can be. If you're, in, if you're in a profession like mine, you don't even try to disentangle it. You you're just, just very it. practical yes. about it. It's like what you wear on television. Yes. You, know, you put yourself in a certain uniform, yes. the sort of thing I'm wearing tonight, which I probably did instinctively because I thought... I should have You'll a tailored be jacket yes. because I'll sound more authoritative and look more authoritative. Oh. But you, you sort of get, you know, it's a practical choice. I'm a bit and then floppier. After a bit. I'm not tailored. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, I can see if you are on TV, it, you know, you're, you're facing millions and, you know, you've, you've got to think about it. But, but in everyday life, in your college, in, you know, in Churchill or in the department or committee anywhere... I still, I still resent the idea that it is 
how you look and how you sound that carries more weight than the actual content. That, that just, mm. you know... It, it's but, you, but, you know, men are making these choices all the time too, aren't they? Do I wear a tie, don't I? Yes. No, I think it's getting harder, actually. I mean, it used to be that there was a very clear uniform for men, and it is less obvious now. Uh, and, indeed, I have been told by a, a, a male colleague that actually they think it's easier for women because there's so much more choice... Whereas he can only do it one way and he's got to know what that right way is. Is it a tie or isn't it a tie? I, th I think there can be, you know, I just came back to my own career experience. Um, so being a woman sometimes can be an advantage. So going back to being a journalist in the Soviet Union, um, I think you could get access to places because they thought you didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still there as a BBC correspondent observing but things. But you're not a very important one because you're a woman. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. So they, and they didn't tell you things because they think, oh, she's just a woman. And you write them down, put them in your report. Um, you can get through checkpoints more easily. I mean, I've definitely been going through checkpoints and they've said, puh, gentiony. I had a female translator. Whereas if I'd been a tall, gangly Frenchman, especially someone who didn't speak Russian, they'd have probably said, stop, can we see your passport? Right. So, and, and there have been occasions in... Um, more traditional parts of the Soviet Union, including more traditional parts of Russia, where you go and you meet the first party secretary or the mayor or whatever it is, and um, they, you know, you're from, you're a foreigner, they host you, they sit you down, you have a meal brought to you, served by women who disappear back into the kitchen. But you can play a trick of saying at the end, oh, I'll just take these plates out. And they say, all right then, because you're a woman. And then, and then you, then you get go into the kitchen and talk to the women. Whereas and, and they a male journalist to couldn't do that, no. no. I mean, definitely this has been the case for female colleagues of mine during the Taliban in Afghanistan. Mm. You could, it was very difficult for male um, correspondents to get to speak to women, a lot of women. But a woman, you could do it. Were you ever in Afghanistan? I was briefly. I went on one trip, I went with David Miliband on his first oh, yes. trip. And it was the um, day after the king died, so we were there for the funeral. It was um, 2007. So we all gathered in the presidential palace, all the warlords, all those people like Hekmatyar and all those scary people who are still around, uh, to pay respects. And then we all walked through the centre of Kabul, snipers on all the roofs. Um, all these uh, different tribal leaders and David Miliband in his blue suit and fresh face is the only Westerner there. And Good you. for him, though. Yeah, no, he, I mean, he's, a, he's, he's great, David. He has a sense of sort of history and occasion, and he's just very excited to be there at this historic moment. Yeah. But it's also interesting to think that we, I mean, there were snipers on the roofs, but there was no trouble. You wouldn't do that now in Kabul. You'd think there'd be a suicide bomb. Yes. Mm. So and, things and, change very quickly. And did you feel you were on the moon now, that it was... Oh, yeah. I mean, Afghanistan is just... <laughs> I mean, it looks like yeah. the moon. Yes. <laughs> well, presumably not Kabul, but... Mm. Mm. No, it was a terrific trip. We went to Helmand too, um, okay. which was already getting a bit dangerous. Right. Yeah. Um, we had to helicopter into the base, um, and uh, we didn't drive out. It was too dangerous. And um, they were still talking um, in policy terms about building a road to the Kajaki Dam, but um, we went and interviewed the squaddies, and they told us just how dangerous it was yeah. outside the... Yeah. compound and it was pretty clear this was a pipe dream and did, did you get an adrenaline rush from doing that kind of thing or were you just permanently <laughs> no I didn't I know I wasn't scared I, I just yeah heightened awareness yeah. so exciting so interesting and you're on a mission there to try and turn it into good television or write a good report yes. and a uh, sense of privilege I do think you do you do stop you don't think about the danger when you're on assignment like that. I remember in Moscow once, 1993, Yeltsin turned his, um, his uh, guns on his own parliament. I don't know if you remember that. It's, uh, so he, um, he fell out with his parliament and he bombed them. Well, shelled them. And um, the parliamentarians, they were sort of the beginnings of the kind of nationalistic far-right Russia that we're now more familiar with today. And some of them set up snipers on the, on, from apartment blocks and were sn shooting people on the bridges. And I, there were lots of crowds around, people walking their poodles and things like that, Sunday afternoon. And I remember going, parking my car and going out with a tape recorder to interview these people to say, 
why are you not scared that Skype is on the... And they turned around and quite rightly said, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> but you kind of forget when you're a journalist that you're... You, you, know, you were also a target. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And that, that can be dangerous. But, yes. Yeah. So before I throw it open to the floor, you've come back to Cambridge, you've come back in a, a very different guise. How do you see Cambridge now? I mean, it's not the sleepy little town, you've already mm. made that, mm. that plain, but you know, you're now inside the university in a different way. Mm. What's your reaction to it? Well, it's a great place. I feel it's a huge privilege to be here. It's absolutely wonderful, loving it. Um, and I feel very at home, actually. Okay. Um, and very comfortable in my lovely college, but also in the city more generally and in the university. And I think um, perhaps one of the reasons is that it's a much more, perhaps a more international place than it was when I grew yes. up. So um, the faculty is more international um, and there's a much bigger community of postgrads here now. Um, I mean, in our college, we have many more than the... I mean, I remember in my college in Oxford, there were maybe six or seven graduate students. I mean, Churchill's always had a You've big... You've always had a lot. And yeah. so I think other I think colleges, most colleges have, have... And they're very international. And then the postdoc community too, yes. which has grown so much. And is also very international. And you know, long may that last. We do hope very much that Brexit won't make that more difficult. Uh, and I, I, I love the way... I think it's partly to do with dig digital technology and communications too. So there was my father going off every summer to Romania or Bulgaria. Mm. Otherwise, how on earth could he talk to these mathematicians? Yes. Now people can collaborate online. Yes. And there's a lot more to and fro. And um, everybody is both very focused here in Cambridge on their research and teaching. But, you know, through the year in vacations, they're also off at conferences and doing field work and people are coming here. And so... I think it's, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I think perhaps if I was a 16 or 17 year old in this city, I'd still be itching to get away. <laughs> well, I think by definition, that's what happens when yes, you're exactly. But I think there would be less, you know, it, 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 is, a, it is a place which has a lot going on, much yes. more going on than... And, and much more open to the world and full of people coming and going. So I think that's... Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I certainly think when I was a student here, there was a feeling that it happened in London, you know, that... that Cambridge was at the end of a train line and, you know, things happened in London and now I don't think people would feel the same way, though it's much, much more happening here. That's certainly right. Excellent. Well, now I should throw it open to the floor. We have two roving mics. There's one and the other one is there. Right, who'd like to ask Bridget a question? Ah, don't all speak at once. Nancy's got one left. Thank you. Uh, out of curiosity, who were the Russian novelists that you were studying during your PhD, or were they not novelists, but other sort of writers? My, who, was I, who was I studying? You, you said when you were doing your PhD, you were studying literary, yeah. Russian literary works. Yes, Andrei, the, the writer Andrei Platonov, who ah. was, um, uh, he's very, very well known in Russia. He's actually rather well translated in, into English now by Robert Chandler, um, but he's quite... He's a bit of an acquired taste. He, so you weren't doing the, the famous uh, kind of, you sorry? know, you weren't doing the famous plays. You talked about liking the theatre. I just wanted the Chekhov and so on. It turned you on to that yeah, sort of thing. No, I mean, Russian literature was... I'm still very excited by Russian literature. Um, and uh, it was a revelation to me when I began learning the language as a schoolgirl to realise there was this fantastic literature there. And then, of course, when you start to realise the wealth of Russian poetry, which you can't really access through translation, or only, you know, translators can't do what Russians do with the language, which is such a, you know, it's a highly declined language. You can play all sorts of wonderful games in poetry with the stress and the shape of the words and so on. So, you know, you have to know the language to be able to appreciate all that. Yes. So and that was wonderful. Certain, I didn't actually study poetry for... Um, postgrad I, I decided to do prose and one of the reasons for that was in that first year when I was in Voronezh I became very fascinated by the impact of politics on literature and um, uh, what was happening to literature in the Soviet period because I think so we're talking about 1970s I think at that point yes Solzhenitsyn had just got the Nobel Prize but there was still not so much knowledge of, of what was coming out of the Soviet period. I mean, now it's much better known. All these wonderful exhibitions that have been 
in this 100th anniversary year of the revolution of the, um, of the arts, for example, um, but, but also in literature. In the 1920s, it was an incredibly exciting period. Platonov was based in that period, and he began writing rather bad poetry and articles in, in, in love with the revolution. Then he fell out of love with it and began to write satirically, and they evolved into quite philosophical, anti-utopian, um, rather phantasmagorical um, novels and plays as well. And so he was a very interesting character as a very Soviet writer, but working who, with the politics of the place as, as much as the yes. literature. That's but presumably it mattered who was translating these Russian pieces into English. Mm. And there were certain people, weren't there, who did it initially and were terribly well known. And then presumably now it's changing. You yes. Did, Yes. yes, so um, I would say again the name Robert Chandler, mm. who uh, lives in London and um, has uh, translated most of Platonov, is doing other works too. Um, and another work, which he translated a, a little while ago, but is absolutely masterful, I think, is uh, Life and Fate by um, Vasily Grossman, which was written about 1941 in Stalingrad and was his sort of... Um, Soviet answer to war and peace. So it's about war, in this case, the Second World War, seen quite close up around Stalingrad, but through the eyes of ordinary people of different sorts, soldiers, families, some people back in Moscow. And he's exploring... Um, he, he does have some vignettes too, which are German, so he's sort of looking at Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany and, and this war. And it's, it's quite a, it's an epic novel. It's, and I think in Russian it's quite hard to read because he wrote it in the Soviet period with an eye to trying to publish it there. And I think he made some compromises with the language which make it just a bit dense. But Robert has translated it in a way that it's very easy to read. So I think actually it's one of those funny cases where the translation might ex excite the foreign reader more than the original does the Russian reader. So this question from Andrew at the back. Um, so you, you mentioned Gorbachev and Brezhnev and Yeltsin, but you didn't mention Putin by name mm. at least. But you've looked the man in the eye and um, sh shaken his hand. And I wanted to know what that experience was like and also what you make of, you talked about current politics in Russia and could you say a little bit about that? What's, what's become of that and in particular in the person of Putin? Uh, yes, so I've interviewed Mr. Putin twice. Um, I've met him on quite a lot of occasions because I have um, been at an annual conference the Kremlin runs for Russian experts for quite a few years, though not recently. Um, I, some people here have heard me talk about this before, so my apologies to them. But um, I interviewed him first in 2001 when he'd just been in a year. And I think he's actually a remarkably consistent character. And... Um, I've said elsewhere quite recently, he's, he's the nearest he's come to an autobiography, which is called First Person, as Pyotr Litsa, which was issued just after he became Russian leader and was the basis of three journalists interviewing him for over three days, and he talks about himself and his background. You read it now, it still gives you a very good insight into him. So he was very frank at that early point, and it's stayed all the way through. Um, but I think initially he was... You know, quite receptive, quite, quite sort of, he, he was unformed yet as a politician and insecure in his role as Russian president. I, don't, I genuinely think he didn't seek it. And Russia's position at 1999-2000 wasn't good at all. It had just come out of a default. Um, inflation had been rampant. The 90s had been awful. Oil prices were very low. Uh, and his insecurities came across in that first interview and he was probably more revealing than, in retrospect, he would have wanted to be. Um, but he was still very consistent. You know, I asked him what he was reading, and he said, the biographies of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. It was kind of, you know, reflective of the Putin we know now. And um, he was very tough on security questions in Chechnya and things, aggressive. Um, but on more personal things, he, he admitted his wife wore the trousers in their marriage and that sort of thing. And, don't think the later Putin would have told you that. <laughs> and, and, and five years later, when I went back and interviewed him again, by now, the oil price is very high. His, some of his early reforms had worked well. The country had got stability back. 
paid off its foreign debt, which no one thought it would do. And he, um, he was now very assured and keen that Russia should be treated as a global power on a par with, every, with everywhere else, including the United States. Quite cocky, um, not insecure at all. Um, a bit finger-wagging, really. Um, and uh, very keen to put me in my place as a woman. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think, you know, he's clever. I think he's very clever and competent. He can talk without notes for three hours. He's got a very clear sense of the things that matter to him. And true to his KGB training, security, national security, um, sidelining enemies, making sure you're in control, that's always been a feature of him right from the beginning. And we see that very clearly now in his policies. And uh, the 2011 protests, which happened at the end of 2011 in particularly Moscow, but other places, when people came out on the streets to complain about fraudulent elections, but then it morphed into saying, we want Putin to go. I think that was a massive shock to him. He didn't see that happening. He didn't see it coming. And I think he's concluded the West made it happen. That's the way he <coughs> explains it to himself as an external enemy, because if he had to admit that there was something wrong inside Russia, that would be too difficult to do. And that's driven a lot of his policy since, and we see it playing out now and what's happening today. So the big question with Putin has been for quite some years, given he's now been there 17 years, is how long will he bear, be there and what happens after and how does that happen? And how long can he sustain this? And I think a lot of analysts think it's becoming harder and harder to sustain it because he used to say... I will lift you up from your knees. And then he did it. So then he was able to say, I changed Russia, transformed it, made it great again. And you know, your pensions are better and the, we stand out, hold our head high in the world because of me. But then the economy started to falter. But then they had the whole Crimea-Ukraine crisis that made him rally to people. So what's his story now? Well, he can say we've been very successful in Syria, as long as they are successful in Syria. They're now... Um, holding the brunt of the diplomacy with the West. The Geneva talks are going nowhere. It's now he's shuttling. And is it going to lead to a solution? It's not at all clear to me that it is. Maybe he can make it appear as though it's one. Um, <coughs> Ukraine is carrying on, bumbling along, simmering war. It just doesn't get reported very much. So that's how he's dealing with that. But it's a problem for him. Um, and relations with the West, well, you know, the sanctions are still there. Um, and quite where the whole story of um, getting involved in information warfare, for want of a better word, whether he intended to put Trump in power or, or whether, whatever he intended to do, whether it was just maximising a place where they knew they could make a difference, which is, they stole a march on the West, if you like, in daring to do the thing that other people weren't yet and which you could, with limited resources, make quite a bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. And they never realised it would quite go as far as electing Trump. Um, you know, that's something that may come out, yet we don't really know. Maybe it will never come out. But um, where it leaves Russia, I don't know. I mean, it partly depends on what conclusions are reached by Western governments, I suppose, about what they think about what's going on. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it does happen. What happen depends what happens in Russia internally. Uh, to me, there's quite a lot of evidence there's not been that much trickle down. In the big cities, their lives are immeasurably better. But in small villages, it's much worse, and some of them have died away completely. And people's aspirations, will they remain happy with what they've got? Will they want something different? Will they agree to turn their backs on the West? I'm not sure. I think Russians are essentially very European people. So I think that's a problem too. Sorry, it's a bit of a meandering answer, but it's a very large subject. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question down here at the front. Yes, um, uh, just wait for the mic, please. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, with the introduction of um, rolling news, um, fast updates, Twitter and texting society, um, society has become used to image and representation communicated that has immediacy with events on the ground. 
Evaluations are now frequently enumerated and measured through specific recognitions, the argument being that this grants greater certainty. Yet quality um, in education is often the ability to synthesize and recognize structures that are relational, complex, and perhaps obscure as long-standing, rather than apparent, specific, and immediate. Um, is the move towards specific recognitions with immediacy thus an advance or a masking of what is really there, or in the case of higher education, should be there? So that's a very long question. I'm not sure if I've understood it. But does it boil down to the fact that here we are, we're living in a digital age with images everywhere, and that's what grabs our attention, um, whereas actually we should think about things in more nuanced and complicated ways? Well, I, I think what I meant, what I meant was that um, in current day, we get, we get the recognitions that are now given um, credence and value People have got used to them being very short, very short term, and then their the temporal base, and also they're very immediate, and they're also quite short. So um, the, the sort of bumper sticker culture, bumper that... sticker culture, and also that you have to show to be to be relevant. If you if you hide in the background, you're not seen, and you're not assumed. The the, the assumption is that you're not you're not worth anything. The value is very much upfront, in your face, and short, and with immediacy. But what I'm, my my argument is. Real quality takes the time, is longer, and is more difficult to see, particularly if your viewpoint or what you've gotten used to is, is immediacy. If I understand you rightly, um, this is a concern at the pressure that might be on academics, but also on others, on journalists, to produce um, bite-sized gobbets that will grab people's attention and then they'll move on. Twitter sentences, right? And then the longer pieces, the long documentaries or the big books don't get read, right? Is that, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So um, what do I think about that? And I think, you know, I think it is a problem um, that people are not reading their way through books. And let's face it, it's not just teenagers. It might be us too, because we're all so busy. Uh, and I profoundly believe that reading things that are long or absorbing things that are long and complex is essential for um, brain health, for keeping you thinking in complex and long ways. And if you only absorb short things, you somehow stunt yourself mentally. But I also believe in our digital age that these tags that you might get can be ways to take people to longer form things. So a Twitter handle, a Twitter message can take people to a link of a book which they then might buy, which otherwise they might not have known about. Certainly in my case, they take me to long analytical articles that I might never have found. And it's a quick short time. So I think it can be a, you know, it can be something to worry about, but it can also be an opportunity. And if you're an academic, or if you are, as I was in my former life, a journalist who liked to think analytically, then it could be useful to get a short piece out there on the news if it might take people to a longer analytical article you'd written or, you know, take them to other, spark their interest in other ways. So I don't see it as necessarily... Um, I don't think one need crowd out the other. One can facilitate the other. I can see that. My, my, my worry is that the, the viewpoint of what's taken as valid becomes very, very immediate. I mean, for example, the university has a lot of kind of um, showing and um, open days, and it, you have to show yourself. And the, the, the qualities are, are, um, that are there are perhaps are more universal and, and more important. Um, they, they take longer to form, and they're more, much more at a higher abstractive level. They're not something you can show at a, in a Twitter update. Uh, personally, I think open days are a good thing. I think I would agree with you. I would agree with you completely. But I wonder. Um, I just don't think. I just want. I think whether there's a balance that, that isn't necessarily located correctly. Okay, I thought I was arguing for a balance, but maybe yeah, I didn't there's get my point across. There's a question uh, just behind. Thank you. How do you see the evolving role of the foreign correspondent? And is there anybody in particular that you would pick out as a, a journalist that you respect? I'm a big fan of Carrie Gracie in China, for example. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, Carrie's a good friend. Um, uh, 
I, th I think it's an interesting question because you could say, um, why do you need to have a British person who's learnt Russian at the purse in Cambridge being your Moscow correspondent? Why don't you have a Russian? Um, and I think the, the BBC in particular, which has more correspondents than most of these outfits, uh, has raised this question and examined it and has modified its policy. And you'll probably have noticed that alongside long-standing foreign correspondents of my type, who are Brits, who are educated here and then went out and used their expertise like Carrie, um, but essentially um, they're, they're foreigners, this, the, they're used, but also you find locals are used more too. So the, the reporting in the last week or two on uh, the demise of Mugabe, you'll have noticed that if you're watching the 10 o'clock news, you might well have been watching Fergal Keane. But a lot of the other reporting might be done by possibly Zimbabweans or certainly people from Southern Africa who are also very good and very nuanced in their reports. So the BBC's response to that has been to say, let's have both. Um, it's, um, it does create practical problems. So if you have someone who's very, very good and who's... Uh, in Kabul, and they are Afghani, and they have fantastic contexts, and they're the ones who can get to the site where a suicide bomb has gone off and film it and interview the police chief in a way that a foreign correspondent would never have been able to do that. If you want to progress their career, where do they go next? Because they will never have that local knowledge when they go to Beirut or, you know, Buenos Aires. And they may not even be very happy there. So um, it's not immediately clear that you can make the same career. You can't substitute one for the other. Uh, besides which, sometimes it's useful to have someone who has a big overview or a different talent. So say Fergal Keane, who you ask asking who I respect. I respect Fergal a lot. He writes beautifully. He has huge humanity. He'll laugh himself at his style of bleeding heart on sleeve in a self-deprecating way, but he's very aware of what he's doing. But, you know, his big view is sometimes useful. Sometimes you don't want to have just the person who's got the more microscopic view of the local politics. You want to have someone who can bring historical or geographical breadth. So I think the answer is you need both. I'll take one last question at the back, please. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, you've been talking about the importance of voice and clothes in terms of influencing. Uh, I personally feel that uh, the human senses are all involved in the way you are perceived, interpreted, etc. I was uh, wondering uh, how did you adapt uh, your human senses uh, and uh, your communication by using uh, everything that can influence the human senses uh, to actually become part of the Russian citizenship, in a way you said earlier that it was pretty much uh, natural to you. How did you do that? How did I, how did I fit in? Yes, did you, how did you, because the vices is important, the way we look is important, but I think that even the way we smell is important, the way we walk is important, uh, is much more than just the voice. Mm. And uh, I personally travel quite extensively for business myself, and I do feel that uh, I had to adapt. Mm. And uh, I've never been in countries such as Afghanistan, nevertheless, or Russia, so I'm quite interested to know if there is anything specifically well, that you have to work it on. It depends where you, where you are. I mean, well, I remember when I arrived in Varonish, this town where I was a student, age 19 or whatever I was. I, at that time, I had waist-length hair. And uh, to begin with, I dressed the way I did here, uh, and I had my hair loose. And after a bit, I got fed up with people thinking I was a gypsy, because this was uh, Voronish in the mid-1970s. It was very old-fashioned. You know, this is very, it's, it's quite hard to understand now quite how cut off it was from, uh, from the West, or even people traveling very much, because it was difficult to travel in the Soviet Union, even within Russia. Um, and uh, in Voronish at that time, if you were a young woman, when you reached 18, when you were a child, you'd have your hair in a nice Russian plait, 
And then when you reached 18, you'd put your hair up. And it was exactly like what my grandmother used to say to me. She said, Bridget, you have lovely hair, but why don't you put it up like a nice young woman? So she was born in 1898, I think. That was the world she came from. And um, so, you know, this was another thing I learned in Veronish about the modern world, that there were different modern worlds. I mean, this was a world where it was perfectly normal for young women to walk down the street hand in hand, which you wouldn't find in the West. Um, and um, so I, I had a sort of crash course in how the way you look, you had to think quite hard. And certainly in a place like Veronish, I didn't really want to be seen as the going down the street as, as that obvious Westerner. I mean, some things I couldn't change, so my footwear. But I borrowed a coat from a Russian friend. I had a Russian coat. Um, I got a little um, net bag, a whisker, they called it, a perhaps bag that you used to carry with you, if you so in case there was a good queue to join where you could, might find something at the end of it which you know, was um, in shortage and was good to buy. So I began to sort of act the part, really, and, of course, the interesting thing is, it comes back to what we were talking about with voice level, is when you start to act the part, to some extent, you begin to think the part. And um, so I think, you know, that's good to do. If you're trying to learn a language and get in the culture, you, you don't want to lose your sense of self. I never did. It was so different. Cambridge was so different. I'd never had any difficulty. I, it was never in danger of... of, of um, although I do remember when I came back from that year, my father said... Bridget, I think you ought to shake yourself out of it and stop behaving like a Soviet. <laughs> so it obviously did rub off. But, um, you know, and, but later when I was correspondent in the late 1980s, um, at this time of turmoil in Russia, I was working for the radio to begin with, so not in a team. Later I worked for television in a team, but on my own. So um, it was very important to me to be able to move around and be listen to people, say, in crowds, or... Um, uh, go and meet people and not have them immediately think, oh, I better be on my guard. And so I did dress down, if you like. Um, and, uh, you know, at a certain point, in the, after the Soviet Union collapsed in, early, um, in the early 90s, it became a very chaotic and sometimes lawless place. And actually, it was also useful just to stay safe, to dress down, to uh, not wear obvious... I mean, I just would never wear... There was a whole range of things in my wardrobe I would just never wear because they were, they just screamed foreigner and I didn't want to be seen as a foreigner. So, I don't, is that what you meant? Yeah. Not quite, that was interesting. I personally think that uh, is a little bit more complex, uh, but you wear camouflaging effectively. But I think about myself uh, in, uh, in an environment such as Cambridge, for example, I do find that it's very difficult for me to merge into the academic. Uh, uh, wilderness uh, and uh, not to appear cl clearly different from the majority. So there are certain things which uh, will be very difficult to, to achieve and it's not just about the voice possibly and, uh, and the way you dress. But I think that uh, what you describe is exactly what I was expecting because it is a more of an, an immediate uh, look uh, of the person that uh, we protect you in the kind of environment. Uh, we become part of that environment, uh, to live within the environment uh, to a much deeper level, I think that uh, the changes uh, are going to be of different level, a different I, I mean, kind. They, they certainly are, and these things can be very subtle. I can remember a Russian friend of mine um, whose aunt had married someone from Iceland, so she'd left, and she came back for a visit. We're now talking about the 1980s. And she said, I saw her at the airport, and I could just see the way... Um, she was standing on one leg, tapping one toe against her ankle. So, you know, it's like this. Just, I mean, just, you know, she's standing there just doing this. And she said, a Soviet person would never have done that. She, I could see she'd, she'd already got the mentality of being a Westerner in Iceland because we're always just a little bit on our guard in the Soviet Union about, in a public space, in that particular political society, you were always just a bit wary about how you were. And so uh, that's interesting um, observation of the way you change your body language depending on your environment. And I, th I think um, I certainly picked up some of that, um, you know, th those habits of how you are. I mean, I noticed people make, made eye contact much less in the street. Um, 
and um, just the way you behave. I mean, pe classically, people would not um, smile as much. You know, Americans smile a lot, don't they? They're always trying to engage you with a smile. So I found after living five years in America, I was always trying to engage people with a smile. You just pick these things up um, from your environment. But I think, you know, different societies take different cues. So I always thought in this society that we pay a huge amount of attention to the way people speak. Which, um, so if you come and you don't speak English absolutely fluently, then there's always a slight problem because we're always listening to each other to find out what part of the UK we come from and what social class we were. You know, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. I mean, I'm going back a bit on what I said as a teenager, but you know, classically, you meet someone on a train and they're very shabbily dressed. But um, the moment they open their mouth, you know they went to Eton, and then you place them. Yeah, in England, the pronunciation uh, more yeah. than the look. Yeah. In Italy, where I'm coming from, will be more the look than the pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah, it is, it is. These things are different in different societies. But then, it's so fascinating, isn't it? Because this is also part about, this is what learning languages is partly about. It's not just about the words. Yeah, multicultural organization is what I am fascinated by, and that's why I was asking the question. Because it seems to be a very simple thing, but I think that what you referred to to me is a very instinctive behavior. You do respond instinctively to certain things that you describe like uh, the tipping of the foot or whatever. You know instinctively that you've got to be alerted. And I think that is all very uh, fascinating stuff, quite psychological. Thank you. I think we'd better stop at this point. There will be drinks in the buttery, I believe. There will be drinks out there somewhere anyhow. Um, so thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me.